Welcome again to the Sutherland Report. Thank you for joining me. One of the incredible pleasures I have of doing this and really pushing to get this off the ground is that I then can connect with contacts of mine who are in, who are in this fight and to actually, for a change, have a conversation about what is going on over here. So I'm now going to introduce a friend of mine, Robert Ords, who is the longtime director of the Bruise Group. And I will immediately get him to explain that. And then we will get into our Brexit fight from 2016 and what has gone on over the last nearly eight years. Can you believe how time flies? Robert, Thank you so much for joining me today. It is lovely to see you. And just for viewers who will eventually see this, you and I have actually physically met. We had a, a very nice, uh, a very nice drink in London with another mutual contact of yours, Neil McRae. And I hope I look forward to uh, interviewing him as well. But Robert, thank you so much for your time and the wonderful opportunity to talk about British politics and what what is actually going on at the moment. Robert, could you explain briefly or take as long as you want the history of the Bruce Group, your role in that, etc.? Well, it's great to see you again, Mark, and it's been uh, many drinks in in London <laughs> that we had, and, uh, and and Birmingham as as well as I as I recall. Yes, it's yeah. great to be back in, back in touch, and real pleasure to be be on your show and in front of your your viewers. Thank you. Yeah, the, the, Thank the Bruges you. Group, we're, we're a think tank. We're founded by Margaret Thatcher. Margaret Thatcher made a speech, a very famous, very influential and controversial speech in September 1988, where set out her vision for Britain, which would be not consumed within the emerging European Union, uh, the European community, as it was known then, where, of course, power is being centralised around Brussels and, of course, later Frankfurt as well, with the decisions made uh, by an unelected, unaccountable elite that would be over-regulating, strangulating the life uh, out of uh, national democracy and national countries. And, of course, the that very special spark that makes the English-speaking world so successful. The European Union was trying to strangle that, and Margaret Thatcher was saying no and setting out her alternative vision, which is Britain in the wider world, actively participating with other countries, a free economy, lower taxation, comp competition, and uh, protecting our alliance with the United States, which is being undone by the EU, which has its own military ambitions. And Margaret Thatcher set out her vision and that transformed British politics along with the work of the Bruges Group, which did the intellectual work setting out this vision and creating Britain as an independent state, which is what we are again. And despite what many people, the, the doom mongers say, Britain is outperforming, even though we've got our own difficulties because our own conservative government has actually failed to honour the principles set out by Margaret Thatcher is actually, but it's still outperforming that, uh, those economies on the, on the continent, that of the European Union. And of course, you know, our trade has actually increased since uh, we left the EU. So Brexit is a success. We can do so much more and there's so much more still to be done. That is undeniable. But the work of the Bruges Group, we set out our intellectual vision of an independent country not being pushed around by uh, foreign institutions and, of course, having our own government, which would be accountable to us and not overly mighty over the citizens of a country who should indeed be sovereign. Robert, in June 2016, if my memory serves me correct, 17 million 410,752 people were the majority of over a million made a democratic decision to leave the European Union. Since then, we, you, and many other people were involved. I felt, this is my opinion, it's as though we felt a fight with our own government. And then we realised the establishment, the elites that are behind that, in the fact that they did not want to honour, they did not want to honour that vote at all. 
Robert, where are you've laid out brilliantly when you've said, despite what is going on, despite the media, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, we have we have left. I'm not being rude. Have we really left? What are we going to do? Why have the Conservatives not ripped up the thousands and thousands of laws, etc.? Why have they not said, well, we're going to we're going to uh, charge out of this and charge out of that? Why? I could be wrong. Do people feel that that has not happened? Yeah, well, I, I started the Bruges Group in 2001 and we worked ever so hard over more than 15 years uh, to, for my, my myself, to get that referendum victory along with others in June 2016. Of course, the Bruges Group has been going since, since the early days mm -hmm. of 1989, shortly after Margaret Thatcher's speech and she's our founder president. Of course, that was a really strong, long battle. But the fight only really began when we had won that referendum. Then, then, then we really had a fight on our hands because they were trying to undo the referendum. It was the biggest mandate in British politics ever, the biggest turnout in a, in a, in a referendum. The, if, it was a, for, if it was a vote for government, there would be an overwhelming majority in the British House of Commons. It was uh, most parliamentary seats, the, the, the voters there voted for Brexit voted to leave the European Union, but the establishment tried to undo it. They tried to talk it down. They, people were were in, in, insulted, uh, made out that they were deplorable for yeah. exercising yeah. their yeah. democratic rights. Uh, yeah. Politicians tried to row back, even though they said, oh, we'll honour the results of the referendum. They tried to absolutely ignore it. And then, of course, what finally happened is that they signed a, an exit agreement, a withdrawal agreement with the European Union, but it kept us tied to many elements of European Union law. Section 29, as I recall, of the withdrawal agreement means our domestic law has to, well, can't be incompatible, shall I say, with European Union law. And the hundreds of thousands of pages of regulations still apply. They haven't been ripped up, even those that we would we would like to get, or get, get away with, even those that we can dissolve. They haven't been replaced yet. They've still been kept in force. That, to a degree, is normally normal, but you would expect some action. You would accept some acknowledgement that we are independent. We're going to do our own thing. We haven't, of course, uh, in, in many areas. And there is this elite. And unfortunately, the Conservative Party has not been doing what it says on the tin, as we like to say here. They've been tied to the civil servants, doing what they want and the, the interest of the Foreign Office, which sees its role, that's for... for for our viewers, the, the Foreign Office is a government department that's similar to the, what would be in the United States, the State Department. Yeah. Yeah. The Foreign Office sees its role as, as representing foreigners and, of course, big corporate interests, rent-seeking corporations want to keep us tied to the EU because its regulations damage competitiveness. It means new new uh, entrants into the market can't compete because they've got to get over this massive hurdle of, of rules, of, of box ticking. And we've had an economy, a vision of Margaret Thatcher, which was about incentives. It was about uh, in, investment. It was about uh, inducements. It was about innovation with one replaced with one of box ticking and uh, cr having to cross T's and dot I's and about compliance and obligations and, and and pointless, in some cases, pointless rules. And that's been kept in place. Now, some degree, those rules come from even above the European Union, the whole right. pro process of going towards globalisation. But the European Union is particularly anti-competitive and does its best to make sure that member states of the EU and those... Uh, in neighbouring countries, those who has trade agreements with have to honour their human rights rules, which are charters for um, all kinds of diversity that damages the fabric of our society, yet, of course, doesn't protect people's human rights when they want to exercise their basic freedoms, such as going out their house during lockdowns, for instance. But we'll mm. come to that later, no doubt. And so the European Union uh, still kept it, its, its hold to a degree on Britain and the corporate interests support that. And one of the key things they also like is they, the and they're open about this. They, they don't actually hide it. Uh, they, 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 they are, they're, they're blatant. They want the open immigration because it keeps 
wages low. And th this, this is something that's not even controversial in th that it's happening because they're open about it. As I said, Lord Rose, uh, the chairman of the Remain campaign, was arguing that we shouldn't leave the European Union because it could lead to less immigration. And that would mean that wages increase. That, that's, that's why they want immigration, because, of course, it's more uh, more cheap labor. It means that uh, if you increase the value, increase the quantity of something, no doubt the value decreases. So that's very beneficial for those at the top. It's damaging our economy in the in the long term because immigration means more demand for for housing and public services, which in a small island like the UK, uh, like Britain, uh, and of course, the most crowded major nation on earth, which is which is England, means that we really can't accommodate any more. Uh, but that suits them. Of course, it also means if we're taking on more immigrants, more cheap labor, it means there's less investment in technology and tooling. When, of course, that then damages productivity. So, you know, we they, we have a corporate corporatist elite that wants us tied to the EU because it allows more immigration. And that's why, of course, one reason people, a lot of people voted to leave the EU was that immigration would finally be got under control. That has not happened. So in a sense, to a degree, Brexit has been betrayed by those who were pledged, whose election manifestos, the documents which they stood on and which the public voted on, and we would think they would implement once in power was not honoured. There has been a betrayal. And we've just seen uh, this kowtowing to a corporate interest. And we need to be very, very careful about our, our democracy going forward because it's in the hands of those that don't have our best in the interests at heart that want to turn us into a very different nation, all for their bottom line. Robert, I don't think uh, I don't think I could have said it better myself. And the bottom line is, is that in many ways we are trying to like pack so much in for just to an, under an hour. And personally, I hope that we're going to do this time and time again because there's so much. There is so much to explain, and there are, as I, within uh, a lot of friends in America, the parallels of fight, as you quite rightly say, in, in regard to immigration and what's happening on the Texas border mm. is, is exactly the same, but also weaponized for, for a different reason. And just to say that as a nation, we fit into Texas two and a half times, just under, you know, just over two and a half times. We, in America, as a continent, as a, po a legal population of 320 million, most probably far more than that, we then have a population of 68, 70 million within the UK. Um, Robert, why have, I mean, you've laid it out in regard to the corporate interests. You've just said about the threat of our democracy, which going, for, going forward. Why have these elites think that they are that arrogant where they can actually ignore a democratic vote? They, I remember within Parliament where every single parliament, every single member of Parliament, every single party rather was saying, I think it's better that we leave in the EU. And I publicly turned around and said, I feel as though I'm living in a communist state. What? It's as though our democracy is just being ripped up in front of our eyes. Where, where do we go from here, Robert? Well, what I think is actually happening is what uh, a great man actually predicted in the 1980s. And that's Ronald Reagan. He said, if fascism ever comes to America, it will come in the name of liberalism. Yeah. And that's exactly what we have. Of course, he then went on to define what fascism was. It was public. It was private ownership, but complete government control. And that's the system which we are moving towards. It's very reminiscent. Of, uh, of China. That's a, a system which they are seemingly borrowing from. Of course, many of the elites are in hock to China. Of course, uh, China no doubt will have its problems with its declining population. And there's its, it's uh, housing bubble may be bursting, but at this point in time, they're running the world and elites look to this and think this is this is a model that they, 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 can, they can follow. It's, uh, it's, it's a system where, of course, they've taken advantage of technology to take away people's freedom. Now, the internet, for instance, social social media, we thought they could be great liberating things. And certainly it's great because you, know, you and I are getting our voice out there over 
the over the the the, the media of the the internet and that's that's a that's 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 a good thing there's a double-edged sword of course because it's also a system of control which they're weaponizing in china with their social uh yeah. mm-hmm. credit system where of course if you're putting the wrong things on social media you will then have your rights taken taken away and in fact it's not too different here we have an uh, we have a system that is uh informal uh, you there was there was of course the the phenomenon that if you say the wrong thing you could indeed lose your job it actually goes much worse than that there's in the uk there's 3000 arrests each year for people saying the wrong thing on social media 3000 out of a population of nearly 7 70 million in russia for saying the wrong thing on social media a country that is at least double the size of the UK's population, mm. about 140, 40 million. Mm. There's around 400 rests yeah. for people saying the wrong thing on social media. It goes, you know, we, we have the world is diverging into two authoritarian camps. Of course, you have the BRICS, uh, Brazil, Russia, India, China and South Africa and all the countries that are joining them, all the countries that have resources mainly. And of course, they are they are not free. They have one version of authoritarianism which is deplorable and it's not for us it's against every instinct that the english speaking world used to have and that was a key part of anglo-saxon uh, society and culture going back to time immemorial that we took to the world uh, representative democracy private property rights freedom of speech free markets all the things that underpin and create and preserve and enhance freedom came from the English speaking world, but they're now being thrown away by a, an elites, which are uh, the build back better. We you know, sure. remember that every single yeah. government from the United States to Canada to, uh, that was, uh, to, to the UK, Australia, they're all in hock to the World Economic Forum. We're having that phrase, build back better. And the world is divided into two hemispheres, bricks versus build back better and neither of them are actually fighting for freedom we you and i are mark we are because we advocate those those principles Mm, but they're being undone and that's why we have that's one of the key reasons no doubt why they want to replace our 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 population with newcomers from a world uh for parts of the world where freedom is less well known where people are more compliant that we won't be doing things like voting for Brexit or voting in um, people like Donald Trump that will do as they're told. And I think that is part of the attraction of why the Democrats, no doubt, in the in the United States want more more immigration. Of course, it's the cheap labor. It is a, a hopefully they would get a compliant population where they an employer can just press a button on an app and get a load of workers there and undercut though uh, under undercut those who've been uh, been already employed by them. It is an attack on our rights and our freedom and, of course, our prosperity to serve the interests of a few men right at, at, the, at the very top mm. that just want to have a system where they profit. In a sense, it's a it's a neo-technocratic mm. Um, mm. form of feudalism that, uh, whereas feudalism kept people tied to the land, this, of course, is actually damaging the land. It's actually damaging, damaging farming. It's actually damaging uh, those who uh, want to make a living uh, from uh, within their within their communities and in the area that they've lived and their families have lived for, for, for generations, forcing people to be this mobile international workforce uh, that can be exploited at someone's will. That's the system that they're pushing for. And we have to resist that uh, and make sure our democracy is protected it's in it's in very grave situation at the moment and protect our own rights to have property and our own rights to uh, have our have our own uh, property owning democracy which is what margaret thatcher's vision was which which actually thoroughly opposed to the world economic forum vision of you will own nothing margaret mm. thatcher wanted people to own their own home to have opportunities to engage, to have a real stake in the in 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 the economy through ownership of their their own their own land, their own their own home, and of course partaking in the in the economy, owning owning shares. That of course is not what our our elites want. They want to restrict that, and they want to 
make sure that we're we are con we are controlled and that of course is a is a recipe for impoverishing people uh, but that Absolutely. doesn't no, that that does not that, that doesn't concern those at the very top because of course they have they, seemingly they have this contempt for ordinary people who they would presume are useless you used to have this phrase useless eaters Eat, whereas people on uh, what was known as the as the left wanted were actually openly arguing for many socialists actually arguing for eugenics mm -hmm. and in human policies like that an actual actual uh, thought that um, sterilizing the poor, for instance, uh, or or those that wouldn't adapt to uh, their their new uh, new order should be should be essentially got away with. Those views, of course, are not openly uh, e e expressed, but they are they are preserved among some who who have a contemptible attitude and, and actually want to reduce the population of the earth. There is uh, a various organizations that openly campaign for mm. campaign for that they may be sort of maybe fringe but they're not they're not um completely without without influence and some people openly believe whereas we had before useless eaters now you've got useless breathers that oh well we we're producing too much carbon dioxide which they relabel as carbon a natural life-giving gas and yet they they you know ultimately i think it comes down to uh, wanting to make sure that those at the bottom don't have opportunity mm. and don't get in the way of the environmental extremism of those at the very top uh, that, that use these policies essentially to impoverish and keep those uh, keep keep ordinary people in their place and prevent them having the opportunity to advance in society, which is what Margaret Thatcher wanted. Brilliant, Robert. I... <clears throat> I'm delighted you're saying all this because uh, I people accuse me of being a conspiracy theorist and you've just uh, blown an absolute hole in all of them to say, no, this is true. This is absolutely well, they're, they're true. They're open about it. They're, you know, yeah, they're, there's, well, they are. They're, they're open. You know, they, they don't want us, you know, they'll, they'll fly in private jets around the world to tell us that we've got to change a light bulb. Mm. Absolutely. It, it's, absolutely. It's, it, it, it's absurd. In, in a... Uh, Say, for instance, let's play devil's advocate and presume that carbon dioxide has an effect on on, on the climate. Let's just ignore the fact that uh, the CO, the, in, there's, in, there's saturation of infrared radiation within CO2. And if we produce more CO2, it cannot lead to uh, an increase in temperature. Let's just ignore ignore that fact and let's just pretend let's play the fairy story let's uh uh go down go down the rabbit hole and pretend that that, that, it, that it does have have an impact well in the uk we're being a country that produces less than one percent of global emissions um 15 only 15 percent of our energy actually comes is in the form of electricity and we are being told that we have to change it change a light bulb for that 15 percent of um for that of uh of, of a fraction uh of the co2 emissions which is in the in the global scheme of things absolutely uh negligible it has no no effect but what it does do is it, it impoverishes people and it forces us to pay more for our energy and also it means we have to pay more for our energy and we have to subsidize certain providers. Yes. And yet we're told to feel good about paying more for something which doesn't essentially work, such as a, a wind farm, for instance. It is absolutely absurd. It is it is a con trick. And the easiest way to, to make money for your, your, your corporation is to get a government contract and then run a monopoly on behalf of the government. It's a story that is as as old as, as as the hills that's what used to happen in in medieval medieval england for instance uh there would be a monopoly awarded by by the king in some cases a queen to to and to an individual or company to run an area or indeed to have a have a monopoly on the supply of whatever that that may be that was done away with because it was seen for what it was absolutely corrupt but now we have exactly the same system and we're being tricked into paying more for things when there should be an open competitive market where people can, can compete and those who are inefficient will fail and those who are uh, 
more able and provide a better service at a better price, no doubt will be able to succeed. But always, and if they go too mighty, they'll be broken up like Theodore Roosevelt did in the United States. If a, if a provider becomes too powerful, then of course we need antitrust legislation. We need uh, the Monopolies and Mergers Commission to get involved and break them up. That's not the world we have. We have a system which has emerged where no doubt it did inf infinitely better than uh, a state-owned monopoly or communism or state socialism, to be to be more correct. But still, it's not as competitive as what it should be. We have social media techs operating as a cabal, and of course they do. Adam Smith, uh, the Scottish Enlightenment uh, the theorist, he was quite clear. If you get a room of industrialists together, put them in a room, they're going to form a cabal. That's what happens, and that's what happens here. And we've got a, got a system which is so many suppliers are, no wonder prices are going up so high, because, of course, uh, they are operating as a, as a cabal. Prices go up, but they're still record, record profits. And essentially, most of them are owned by State Street, Vanguard, BlackRock. It, it's you, you, the, the, If you tra trace it all back, there is there, there's a there, there's a there's a woke cabal uh, the woke industrial complex running things and pushing things because it serves their their, their bottom line against the better interests of our of our nation state and our, and our culture and the things which made us great in in the first place which they do not seem to be in a mind to tolerate and we need to push back again we need to push back against this and we need more politicians like margaret thatcher which will give opportunity to those at the least well off and uh, of course Theodore Roosevelt at the same time and uh, who, who would break up who would break up the monopolies and bring down those that are seemingly too powerful. What um, I just one of one of the lovely things I do because I believe in buying books I have a library books have information and I want to definitely get to your latest book because you are an amazing writer um, but this particular book by Batter Your to some controversial, but an extremely very good book. Of course, to some it is controversial because people don't want to face the truth. That particular book lays out what you've just said in regard to immigration into, into the European Union and the European pan-axis with, with Arabia. She she talks about she talks about that. And what I'm what I'm delighted and thrilled by having this conversation with you is just going, Robert, have the floor. Because for us, conversation is so good for our mental health. And I think particularly as men, that's a huge issue at the moment. And the fact that we feel that, no, we can't say this, we can't say that. We can and we must because we are fighting on behalf of everyone else. We don't want, we don't want this tyranny. Um, you raise, you raise uh, Margaret Thatcher. I want to ask you, Margaret Thatcher had an interesting journey, didn't she? Because you could argue when Ted Heath took us into the EU and there they are, is this, he's, he's got this little uh, little paragraph saying, you know, in their manifesto, I'm going to take us into the into the EU. And that is another huge story links with Jean Monnet and all the rest, going back to Arthur Sauter, League of Nations, all the rest. Interesting characters flowing around there. What was her journey? Because would it be fair to say, I saw it, would it be fair to say that at one point she was very pro joining, you know, pro uh, joining the then the common market because of a number of countries that were then able to trade with each other with, a, with having trade barriers low or non-existent, less control, where actually you and I would say that from far earlier than that it's always been always been the common market journey into the european union into this federal state of europe without a constitution and undermining pe people's rights what what do you say about her journey robert what's your take on that yeah margaret thatcher at a time particularly in the 1970s supported what was known as then as the european economic community of course that was a, a a mistake of course margaret thatcher she she told me later said we should never uh, we shouldn't be in the eu we should never have joined the eu uh, and of course came out for 
Brexit and uh, have also, uh, well, before, of course, it was known as Brexit, came out for leaving the European Union. And, of course, also for, for many years back was against the, uh, the, the growth of more, more power. She told MPs to vote against the, uh, the, the Maastricht Treaty, which all I'll, I'll come to all, all this. Basically, at the time, it was thought that Britain was ungovernable. ungovernable. We had rampant politicised uh, trade unions that were literally on strike. You had um, uh, grave diggers on strike in support of the teachers who were on strike in support of the miners, you know, not, you know ignoring ignore their own sort of issues, their own um, grievances that they may have. There was sympathy strikes here. <laughs> the country couldn't, couldn't be run. We had... Uh, we had learnt the wrong lessons from the Second World War. There was this fixation with uh, with Russia and the, the Soviet Union. I thought, well, okay, that's the that's, that's the way to go. And they thought that more if there was more state control and the state ownership of industry, then um, then the country will be more uh, well, well, will be will be will be will be will be will be stronger and it will be will be better off of course the absolute reverse was true and some conservatives who thought that we couldn't run our own country because of course the labor was labor party was was rampant uh, as and, and its trade unions the labor party essentially being a creature of the trade unions or the some trade unions of course we are come to are actually very very useful um but at the time the major organizations were political and they were there to push for more state control. And some people thought, well, if we join the European uh, economic community, they have legislation against state control. They actually prevent that. They want to keep private ownership. Of course, what they didn't realise is that it was corporatist and that uh, uh, corporatism, of course, is a philosophy, it's a rebrand essentially of fascism, which came out mm. of, of socialism. Mm. Mm -hmm. And fascism seeks to resolve co class conflict by bringing everybody together within the state and putting them all around the table, trade unions, business leaders, uh, political political representatives, all under the leader leadership of, of one person. And that was their, their idea. And that, of course, didn't get a uh, popular, uh, doesn't have popular branding after the Second World War. But in the continent of Europe, it, it, it remained alive ideas like that were very strong in fact they go back quite some considerable time and are cultural in their in their instances and so britain joined this european economic community thinking well we can't run ourselves let's get those people across the water to run us absolute betrayal treasonous i know but that's that's what that's what they that's what they thought and thought that okay those economies are growing we're we're declining uh, of course, Britain had declined, declined from the, the leading power in Europe and, of course, global power to, of course, a third rate nation uh, in the in the in the 19 in the 1970s. And it took Margaret Thatcher really to put the great back into into Great Britain. And she did that by. By her background as uh, as her father being a small businessman and of course herself being an exceptionally able lady and, and a scientist with great attention to detail and an absolute drive she knew that small businesses private ownership private enterprise was the way to go and reinvigorating uh, that that spark of competition and element and getting the economy working again and it absolutely transformed of course you also wanted to fight the culture war as well but um we'll come to that later as well no doubt but margaret thatcher of course slowly then realized that okay we're part of the european economic community but they're taking our money they're taking far more with the british taxpayers being ripped off she got some of our money back not not all of it, it was an imperfect as always because things in uh, relating to uh, negotiations in the european union or never get a a good result for one side there's always some kind of messy compromise got got some of our money back that was a victory but then the european union continued to push for more control it was pushing to open up borders across the across the continent of europe impose impose more regulations and margaret thatcher eventually said no this is this is this is this is too much i'm going to put out an alternative vision an alternative positive vision of how things should be done even though her vision was positive and uh, far more common sense and um, fits in with what what the british people actually largely want who've never been fully committed to uh, the the european project as it's known 
she was then removed from office for doing so. And that was a key reason why Margaret Thatcher was replaced as prime minister in 1990. And it kind of sort of all went pretty downhill from, from there. We had the, the men in grey suits running the Conservative Party again. Uh, that we had, uh, we had top, we were tied to the exchange rate mechanism. Thankfully, we, we came out of that, that policy. But we had the, the premiership of John Major, who was like Tony Blair, but, but very grey. Uh, no, no actual, no actual spark there. Apart from he was just following the same policies. And then, of course, we had Tony Blair come into power, who uh, was elected as a Labour leader. Uh, he was, he was on the, the left. Uh, of course, as of, of politics, as we were, as as it would be seen, and of course, he hated the traditional aspect of of Britain, and he was he wanted to change Britain constitutionally, and there was lots of constitutional mm. innovations which have mm. caused uh, endangered the unity of the kingdom, and uh, also led to more more legal involvement, uh, lawyers making the laws rather than just interpreting them. That 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 had emerged, but one of the key things is according to people within the new Labour uh, organisation that was running com the, the country, they wanted to rub uh, the rights noses in diversity and they opened the borders and allowed in literally millions of people. There had been very little, you know, some immigration into the UK since 1066. There had uh, been very little immigration since then. It was, it was some, there was the... the the the, the the Huguenots, various other people, all very small, all easily ignored. In 1997, or shortly after, they opened the borders essentially and mass migration began and it hasn't been stopped. And in fact, the, con the Conservative government at the moment actually had record levels of migration, which uh, surpasses that which Tony Blair inflicted on the country. An absolute betrayal. And that's one reason why they're facing a defeat at the next general election, not because the Labour Party is popular, it's led mm. by someone, Sir Keir Starmer, who looks, makes John Major look, look dynamic and exciting. He, is, <laughs> he, he has a charisma bypass, mm. yet, of course, he is on course to be the next Prime Minister because, of course, Conservatives are largely, perhaps it's a good idea, perhaps it's not, sitting on their hands and saying, sorry, we're not going to vote for the party led by Rishi Sunak that is doing everything that the Labour Party would do and Conservatives should be opposed to. Mass immigration, the highest level of taxation since the Second World War, since yeah. there was a red in tooth and claw Labour government after the Second World War, nationalisation of industries, state policies, uh, replication of the Soviet Union, uh, rationing, enforced rationing, uh, you couldn't buy what you wanted in the shops. You could only buy what the government permitted you to buy. If you had a coupon, then, of course, you could go to the shops and buy enough food for your, for your family. Only if you had a coupon. You couldn't exceed exceed the uh, what the state allowed you to buy and eat. There was that kind of government. Our taxation at the moment in the UK is equal to that. And, of course, we uh, conservatives should be for fiscal responsibility, we're in a position where debt to GDP is around 100%. In fact, we can't cut taxes in the UK because so much of our money is actually going off in interest payments, which have been run up as a result of lockdowns, which the Conservative government introduced because Sir Keir Starmer was essentially, the Labour leader, was essentially making them. And we ran up this massive debt, ruined the public finances and our the interest payments, not just the payments on the debt, the interest payments on the debt that the country has, that this British government has, is actually greater than the education budget. What future is there for a country that is investing more in paying off uh, those who essentially exploited uh, the, the stupidity of a government that was just recklessly borrowing, the more than the investing in the education of the next generation and building up what would be a country's greatest asset its own popular its own population and so we are in a very very difficult position and uh, all this time there's more immigration driving up uh, the, the cost of living and lowering wages at the same time so there is this triple whammy hitting hitting ordinary working people in the in the uk 
and times are indeed difficult and that's one reason why the Conservative Party is in the dreadful situation it is now, because it's not doing what it's meant to be doing, which which people voted for. There was former Labour voters that thought that Brit or the Conservative government under Boris Johnson, who of course has gone, he's not coming back as Prime Minister, but they had, he had promised to get Brexit done. And at last it seemed that there was a British politician that was determined to stand up for British people rather than being a party for... Uh, those are those on benefits or for or, or for migrants, which is what, according to David Miliband, a former late or uh, the other Miliband, thought that the, the Labour Party had actually become. That's how they viewed themselves. And at last, the Conservative Party did what it was meant to be doing, but uh, of course has actually failed to do so. And so there's a great deal of disenchantment. And all those Labour voters that came over to the Conservatives because they thought they'd stand up for Britain have thought, well you're all just as bad. And to use a phrase, it's, uh, you know, Conservatives and Labour for many people are uh, two cheeks of the same arse. Mm, if I, mm, mm. I think uh, you're absolutely right. We have a we have a uni party. I mean, in America, there mm. there was a uni party. A number of uh, a number of people I know in the States, one of their favourite uh, television series from our past is yes minister they actually they they watch that and i encourage them to do so because i think it explains a lot and one of the things that i am uh, i'm struck by there is when suddenly a, a certain a sort of a pivot point in uh, in the late in late 80s when all this all this paperwork was coming down the line from bureaucratic control from europe mm -hmm. and then suddenly suddenly feeding into uh, feeding into our government and people going certain the bureaucratic mindset were then feeling very comfortable about being told what to do you're absolutely right and that phrase that we've forgotten to run we've forgotten to run our own country all these people don't want to run our own country i want to underline something that you've said again about the new the definition of fascism which is public private partnership okay and if there's anyone that really brought that in in hindsight hindsight's a wonderful thing and when you've been on a certain political journey like myself, you look back and think, oh, my goodness, I didn't see that. And of course, Blair, Blair pushed that yeah. on steroids. We have yeah. to say that one of the one and of the of course, there's also, also Sorry. Another, uh, there, there is an element of fascism, which is um, identitarian. It judges the, you know, of course, originally. It, it wasn't that way, and there was, uh, for instance, there was there was there was Jewish people in the in the in the not in the in the fascist party uh, within within Italy, uh, but of course it quickly gave way to uh, anti-Semitic extremism, mm. and there was uh, identitarianism, where they judged people according to their ethnicity, uh, to the color of their skin, for instance, and. Put, not only judge them as in terms of their their ability, uh, but also their their morality as well. And we have exactly the same policies coming back now. Identitarianism, where of course on on the left they will judge people, and if you're a so certain ethnicity, you will then be viewed as uh, as as a, either a perpetrator or a or a victim. No no matter what class you're actually from or your socioeconomic background how much property you own for instance you're judged according to that it's the absolute opposite of what people like martin luther king jr wanted uh, or or anybody from a judeo christian christian background where of course people would in theory be judged judged equally and all have the same moral moral worth or or the same moral questionableness um, if if you're uh, uh, if you, if you if you wish to view view at that and this need to need to contain our, our perhaps our, our darker sides for instance but um, through through institutions uh, that we that we've established over 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 time but we have exactly the same policies and in the fact in a sense it's an inverted form of racism uh, perhaps a feminine form of racism before uh, th those people who were who were fascist would or nazi rather would look upon those who are of a different ethnicity and think that they they cannot uh, they cannot succeed they cannot be any good now of course it's the same and they're saying we have to have special rules for those who are of a different ethnicity because they're not good enough that's what they're essentially saying and that is absolutely alien to 
the Anglo-Saxon tradition, which classes us as all as, uh, have, should have the same opportunity and to raise according to our, our abilities. And, uh, and we all have the same moral foundations, whereas today these, are, these identitarian policies are returning and, and they are very prevalent amongst the woke. So these, these cultural trends don't actually change. And uh, it, it is actually worrying. We wonder where this is going to end up because in the run up to the Second World War, we had, there was, a, of course, in various countries, there was a boiling frog. There, a, a clique would take power. They would pit people, one group against another, and they would then uh, e exploit people as as they as they as they saw fit and persecute groups which were outside of what they wanted. And that goes back to the writings of um, Marx and Engels, who thought that those ethnicities that couldn't um, adapt to socialism should be exterminated. They were quite open mm -hmm. about that in the Victorian era. And um, Karl Engels writing about that in, in Karl Marx's newspaper. They were quite clear about that. And these same ideas are beginning to permeate back in society. And I think we need to resist them. I, I couldn't agree more because as we look, look, you know, we look at Margaret Sanger in the States, we look at the eugenics movement, we look at how, where Hitler then got, got, his, got his ideas from and then expressing the whole Aryan race and then, you know, I'm going to have my third Reich and uh, rule for, for a thousand years, et cetera, et cetera, but I'm going to go and exterminate six million people. Um, do me a favour. And you're right because it's this whole. But, but, I, but it's those who won't, who they think won't conform yes. to their politics. And yes. at this point in time, mm. it's perhaps people like you and I who they think won't conform mm. to their mm. politics. In fact, we don't. We don't conform. No. Uh, we 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 do. Our, we 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 we, champ, we champion liberty. Mm. Uh, and so you know, there, there there is a there is a prejudice against people based on their ethnicity. Oh, you can't say that because you're of the wrong wrong skin color for instance uh, outwardly your wrong wrong skin color and that's this is being used again by the democrats in the united states who have a history of pitting people against uh, other other nationalities other ethnicities rather that's what they were they built their built their power bases on mm -hmm. and they're doing exactly the same thing but and of course they're just different targets now and using different groups to attack other groups and uh, using using mass migration essentially to keep themselves in power and that's what it comes down to Absolutely. there's a few people at the top who are doing this because it enriches them mm. you know, we will you'll see large corporations essentially you know run by some some billionaires that will be pushing this mm. socially mm. um uh, uh, well, what's wrongly described as liberal, but so socially liberal agenda, uh, because it because it essentially enriches them. We're pushing mass migration because it in, in, in enriches them and enhances their power. And they hope that they're going to get a get people in who are going to be compliant and be good little serfs and will do as they're told for not very much. And that's what they 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 want. And that is bad for property owning democracy. Well, I completely agree. And you're absolutely right, because we look at a number of and we're just coming into the last uh, sort of eight minutes, really. But you're absolutely right, because a number of us, you know, we've been we've been censored. We know people that, of course, have been, you know, it's it's lawfare, um, deplatformed, et cetera, et cetera, because it's like, oh, no, you can't say that. You can't say this. And we're going, hold on a minute. What what's the issue here? And especially and I, I put this out there as a as a uh, as a Bible believing Christian, there's a Judeo Christian framework. That's where I that's where I come from. That's that's my lens. I make no apology for that. And you're at, you're absolutely right. It's then be seen as no, we have to we have to come against you. And uh, it's as if to say, oh, we'll create these camps where we're going to reprogram you. Mm. I mean, let's I'll just say this statement. I mean, what people don't know, you know, when in the past, and I think on another occasion we go into this because we both love history. Um, and that is what is so inspiring about you, Robert. I'm not just saying it because you're sitting here, but it's true. And to encourage people to go and learn, pick up books, learn, learn from but the previous what has gone on. 
and we look at Stalin's Russia, etc. You created mm. gulags. And at mm. one point in this country, I think the first Labour Prime Minister, MacDonald, was on about lending Russia anywhere between 35 to 50 million million pounds. Now, I think there was lending, not giving. And what would a what would a tyrant like uh, Stalin have done with that? What built even more, built even more gulags? I mean, people need to know all of the, all of this information. Robert, I want you in the last sort of five yeah, minutes yeah. and I'm going to grab it. I'm gonna, just going to bring your book to the screen because i'm proud to have this and i look forward to meeting you and i get you to sign it i've got to read this but can you talk about um because it's just arrived can you talk about could you talk about this book because you have you have uh, an interesting an interesting comment how culture determined victory and defeat in the second world war world war ii the first culture war by yourself and then we have got the esteemed. This is the ultimate history of World War. Rear Admiral Roger Lane, not CB. What briefly in a few minutes, what was your inspiration for, for writing that? And what's the main headline for that? Where where can people find you, buy it, etc.? Go for it, sir. Thank you, Mark. But yeah, World War II, the first culture war, it's on. You can get it from Amazon and you can also order it through your through your bookstop bookshop as well. But basically, the, the realization is that Britain won the Second World War and Britain and her allies, including the United States and the English English speaking world, essentially, uh, because of ideas that were developed within medieval England, things that go back to the Anglo-Saxon uh, Anglo-Saxon times. So we call that English exceptionism, if you like, and I make no bones about that. But the ideas of representative democracy, horizontal lines of control rather than top-down governments, bottom-up uh, choosing of, of leaders, free markets, private property, sound, sound money, liberty, the in, in an economy built on incentives and inducements. They were the real weapons that were unleashed on the uh, on the the, 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 the Nazis, which were national socialists that believed in state control, that had price that had price controls, that took over industry first, took them into the the uh, right. Reichenschwerk and um, Hermann Göring before all the all industry was put within uh, the uh, German Ministry of Defence. They were socialists. They were, uh, of course, it was only socialists if you were the right ethnicity. If yeah. you were the wrong ethnicity, then you would be cheap labour uh, or slave labour to be exploited. Pretty much similar to the vision of some in the in the in the UK and America that want more that want more immigration. And we need to remember that the Nazis were not against immigration. In fact, there was. Germany at the end of the Second World War, despite their extermination of, of Roma, of Sinti, of Jews and other ethnicities, was more ethnically diverse because they took in more people. They took in French factory workers. They took in uh, took in slave labor from uh, East, East, Eastern Europe, put them to work within their industry, cheap labor, essentially. And it's there, there, there's a there's a there's a similarity towards those who want immigration into the UK now. Of course, they're not doing the dreadful things. Not not yet, at least certainly not. And let's hope not. And uh, hopefully that will never, ever happen again. Uh, they won't be able to get away with it. Although, of course, we see in communist China the uh, persecution of the Uyghur uh, minority. Something uh, as well as also other religious groups. So these things can happen in the modern world. They can actually happen if we're not careful. So basically, we have a the, the Nazis had a system which had based on state control, ex, exploitation, and the Soviets had a similar system, and it didn't work. And they relied on us for their for their weapons, even their oil. They had the they've got the, they had the Caucasus under their control for most of the Second World War, a major oil producing region. Yet to get high octane fuel for, for, for planes, it was easier to take that oil from the Caucasus out through Iran to Britain and to the, to the United States to be shipped back to, uh, to, to, to the Soviet Union to, uh, to then be used in, 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 in fighter planes to take on the Luftwaffe. It was easier to do that and cheaper than for the, the, for the Soviets to do it themselves because they didn't have an economy 
properly based on incentives and inducements and they didn't have meritocracy they had an institutionalized uh, system of corruption uh, a kind of uh, industrialized feudalism where people were told what to do by by a manager who was put there not because he was able but because he knew yeah. the right people a corrupt system uh, and uh, nepotism on a on an industrial scale it's the bigger it's the, the bigger than the corruption of the crime biden crime family if you can even even <laughs> believe that but but these ideas that were developed made in anglo-saxon england which we explo exported to the united states made america the great country that it is and the great ally that it became in the second world war the arsenal of democracy that provided so much of the weapons that would be used and the we've forgotten those values we've forgotten private the value of private enterprise and competition and have a system which is essentially rigged in favor of those who uh, say the right thing social advancement is now reserved for those who are on the right side politically not for those who are the most able who can provide the best products who have the best ideas who have the best who have the um, correct facts and the most persuasive arguments it's about those who are politically on the right side or indeed of the right ethnicity and that's absolutely shameful but i think they do that for a reason because they want to put people against each other but basically the idea that i realized is that you know some people say oh it's not uh, battles that win war it's logistics well actually it's culture which determines a country's logistics there's many nations that have uh the same amount of resources as the united states for instance uh or of course the same population but are unable to have a proper functioning economy is because the united states for instance has the correct culture to have a properly functioning growing economy or at least did before they wanted to change it and england a small nation along with uh, along with the other parts of the united kingdom northern ireland wales and and, and scotland is a very small nation yet had such a dramatic effect not because we had the the best logistics or the best uh most resources in fact the reverse we had a culture of incentives we had one where there was a profit we had a professionalized army that was highly trained rather than a mass conscript force which robert i do it i do it i do it I don't want to stop you in flow, but I am because we're up against the time. But I. But the, but the bless point you. is, we had something very special in England, and we're in danger of throwing it away on the altar of mass migration. We need to preserve this. And the things which gave us victory in the Second World War, we need to understand what exactly that was. We need to okay. understand how we need positive policies to grow our population. Our, our indigenous population needs to be invigorated within the UK. And of course, we need to get our country moving again by restoring our culture and our, and, our, and our values that made us great and that made us unstoppable in the Second World War that we're well, in danger of throwing away. And that's what the book's about. And we need to be about what it is about learning the lessons from the Second World War and applying them to this day and age because we're in a struggle now. Robert, I cannot thank you enough and I want you back, right? I'm going to play us out and thank you so much for joining me. Just stay there. We'll have a conversation afterwards. But bless you. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. Let's keep our world in prayer and learning about what's going on. Bless you for joining us.